we're in a series we're calling The Author. And we spent several weeks in a series we called Tell the Story. We spent all these weeks encouraging you to tell the story. And we've told you, your life is a story. And for the past two Sundays, I've started with this rhetorical question. There are two, actually. Number one, who's the author of your life? And number two, who's the authority in your life? And those are rhetorical questions because they really don't require an answer. I mean, we're in church, and so you're like, oh, he wants me to say Jesus. And yes, I want Jesus to be the author of your life. Yes, I want Jesus to be the authority of your life. But if you take it a little deeper and go, but outside of the walls of this church, who is the author? Who is the authority? Is it me or Jesus? It has to be Jesus. And so far, we've established in this series that Jesus is the author of life, Last week, we talked about how he's the author of salvation. And Jesus, he sums it up. I love what he says in Revelation 22, verse 13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So if you want to argue, well, was Jesus really first? He said he was first. Is Jesus really last? He said he was. He said there's no one else. I'm the first and the last. And so today... Uh, we're going we're gonna to step into the next um, title that I wrote down. And what I did for this series, I just sat down and wrote down, he's the author of, and today we're going to talk about how he's the author of marriage. He's the author of marriage. And maybe you're here this morning and you're single, and you're like, well, great, I'm not going to get anything out of this. No, 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 no. You'll get something out of this. Just listen. Just open your heart and let the Word of God speak to you today. Jesus is the author of of marriage. Marriage was authored and designed by God. He's the author and designer of marriage. God is the author and designer of marriage, not humans. Let me say that one more time. God authored and designed marriage, not humans. So it doesn't matter what any human says about marriage. It doesn't matter how any human defines marriage because the author was God. And we live in a society, we live in a culture that's trying to change the definition of marriage. You can change it all you want, but when you know the author, you realize they changed it, but this is what he meant. And so I was just praying this week, and um, I love to come here and pray when nobody's here. And most of the time I come in and I just have a couple rows of lights on, and it's dark. And I know this is going to sound weird, but I sit in the dark when I pray. I like to go sit um, Actually, over there, kind of close to where Bonnie is. And that's just my, t- my place right now. And in a couple of weeks, I'll move to your seat, maybe. But I was just praying, and I knew what the Lord was laying on my heart for today about him being the author of marriage. And as I was praying, all of a sudden, I had this thought. Have you ever considered the Bible begins and ends with marriage? In Genesis 2, Scripture says in verse 21, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord took, God, took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this is, bone of my, this is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. So right here in the beginning of Scripture, and just in case you're not familiar with Scripture, Genesis has a chapter 1 and we're in chapter 2. So it's really early in the beginning of the Bible. God establishes marriage. He creates Adam out of the dust of the ground. He breathes the breath of life into his nostrils. He puts Adam in charge over everything. And Adam, Adam has an animal parade. He stands there with God and the animals walk by and, and Adam goes, that's a giraffe, that's a horse, that's a kangaroo, that's a zebra. And the, Lord, the scripture says that the Lord said there was no suitable helper for Adam. And so God said, well, you know what? We're gonna, I'm going to keep working. And he caused Adam to go into a deep sleep and he took a rib out of Adam and he made woman. And Adam said, this is it. She's my helpmate. And this here in Genesis 2 is God establishing marriage. He said, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Skip forward all the way forward to the end of the Bible. In Revelation, Revelation 19, the angel said to John the Revelator, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words that come from God. 
And I read that and thought, isn't that amazing? At the end of time, there's a wedding. And you're invited. Are you going? Are you going? Have you RSVP? So what, what do I have to do? Oh, it's simple. Read, read on in there and it says that the way you attend the wedding, marriage supper of the Lamb is have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. And the way you get your name written in the book is through Jesus. There's only one way and his name is Jesus. But there's a wedding at the end and we're invited and it's an honor to be invited to that wedding. And I begin to think about this. Isn't this awesome? In Genesis, God talks about marriage. In Revelation, there's a wedding. So God still honors marriage. But somewhere in the middle, we've kind of messed up marriage. Jesus, the author of everything, he taught about marriage. Matthew 19, verse number four. Look what Jesus says. Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. And then he says this. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So why, how, where does Jesus get his knowledge to teach about in the beginning and teach about marriage? Was he in the beginning? Oh, he was because John wrote in John 1 and said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things are made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Jesus can teach about the beginning and God establishing marriage because he was there. And there are some who want to say, well, Jesus never taught about marriage. Yes, he did right here in Matthew 19. Well, Jesus never taught about certain kinds of marriage. Yes, he did. Matthew 19 is right here in red letters what Jesus taught. Marriage was established by God and ordained by God. And the Apostle Paul wrote, and he described a dream marriage. A dream marriage, Ephesians chapter 5. Paul describes this dream marriage where both partners are doing exactly what the other partner wants and needs him or her to do. Notice what Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We don't like that word submit. I don't want to submit. I ain't doing what you told me to do. You're not the boss of me. You know what I've learned just growing up and being in church and being in the word and being in a marriage is that submission is a two-way street. He, he's not just talking to wives, he's also talking to husbands. So he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now look what he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. A lot of men read those three verses and go, that's right, amen, woman, you should submit to me. But notice what he said. He said, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. In other words, your submission to your husband should be equivalent to your submission to the Lord. And he goes on, and now look what he says, husbands. What does that mean? Men, pay attention. Listen, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So men want submissive wives, but when men want submissive wives, we have to ask the question, do you love your wife like Christ loved the church? Well, but she's supposed to be submissive to me. I'm the head of that family. Well, Jesus is the head of the church. And Paul said, submit, wives submit to husbands. Husbands have to love their wives just as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church so much, he gave his life. He gave everything for the church. In other words, he was sacrificial. So men, ask yourself this. Is my love for my wife, can it be described as sacrificial love? Sacrificial love is not about me. I know I'm meddling a little bit, but we're just going to keep going. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, 
Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. God's design for marriage is a sacrificial male leading an honoring female. God's design for marriage is a sacrificial male leading an honoring female. Their love directed selflessly toward one another would perpetuate their relationship throughout their life. God's design for marriage creates a perfect friendship between a man and a woman. Marriage is the living illustration of the kind of intimacy God desires to have with each one of us. Why does God want to have intimacy with us? Well, it's simple. He created us in his image. He created us to be like him, and he wants to know us in an intimate way. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female he created them. In his book, Wild at Heart, John Eldridge wrote this great statement. He said, God doesn't make generic people. He makes something very distinct, a man or a woman. In other words, there is a masculine heart and a feminine heart, which in their own ways reflect or portray to the world God's heart. Masculine hearts and feminine hearts both project to the world God's own heart. And God created us male and female to come together to have intimacy as a picture of the intimacy he wants to have with us. So God is the author and designer of marriage. And because God is the author and because God designed marriage, we should honor marriage. Hebrews 13, 1 through 6, the writer of Hebrews says, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Verse number four, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have for God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Hebrews 6 is not just a mundane list of do's and don'ts for Christians. Hebrews 6 is God's formula for healthy Christian living. Notice what the writer of Hebrews said. In verse 1, keep loving each other as brothers and sisters. That's a good thing to do. Let's love each other. Number, verse 2, don't forget to love strangers too. Well, I don't know. That's kind of uncomfortable loving strangers, but that's what the scriptures teach us. Verse number 3, love the prisoners and the mistreated. And then you get to verse 4, honor marriage and remain faithful to one another. Followed by verse 5, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. And finally, verse 6, just trust God. Right in the middle of these instructions to love Christians, to love strangers, to love the hurting, to not love money, we're instructed to honor marriage. I want you to think about this. Honoring marriage is like loving Christians. Honoring marriage is like loving strangers. Honoring marriage is like loving prisoners and the hurting. Honoring marriage is like not loving money, and it is like trusting God to take care of you. Look again at verse 4. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. In the midst of this formula for Christian living, we see a warning that God is serious about honoring marriage. This is a snapshot of God's love for people. God loves people who, who, God loves those who love each other as brothers and sisters. God loves strangers. God loves prisoners. God loves the hurting and the broken. God is a God of love. God is not in heaven wanting to punish and destroy everyone who sins. God is a God of love. And he desires for us to live a life of love. Why? Because God knows love is good for our society and for us as individuals. And when we live a life of love, the world sees Jesus in us. For God to not punish sin would make him unloving. 
God's a God of love. Because he's a God of love, he shows us the standard by which we are to live. And when we fall short of that standard, there are punishments that go with falling short of the standard. Well, that doesn't sound loving for God to punish those who do wrong. Hold on a second. If you're a parent, have you ever punished your child? Have you ever slapped the little behind that ran out into the street when you were trying to teach little ones not to play in the street? Why would you do that? I want them to know that cars are dangerous. You can't play in the street. I've seen many parents grab little toddlers by the arm and swat in their behinds on the way back to the yard because they were in the street. We don't look at those parents and go, well, that's just unloving. We go, wow, that's a loving parent that's teaching their children not to play in the street. But yet when we read in Scripture how God punishes for doing wrong, we're like, well, that must make God unloving. No, God is full of love. And as our loving Father, He sets a standard and He wants us to live by that standard. And there are consequences for not living by that standard. So while we love other Christians and we love strangers, prisoners, and the hurting, while we're not loving money and we're trusting God to take care of us, we also have to honor marriage. So let's talk a minute about ways we dishonor marriage. For I feel like if we talk about how we dishonor marriage, it will help us to know how to honor marriage. And let me just make it real clear. The things we're going to talk about in dishonoring marriage, don't do these things because they dishonor marriage. But scripture says to honor marriage. Hebrews 13, 4, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Listen, if you want to honor marriage, don't confuse marriage with what dishonors God. Don't call things that dishonor God marriage, for in doing so, that dishonors marriage. In America today, there's a lot of talk about and a lot of debate concerning same-sex marriages. Every day we hear news reports about courts and judges making rulings and decisions in favor or against this issue. But there's one reason many seem to ignore, that same-sex partnerships are not a marriage. And here's that one reason. They are intensely disliked by the Lord. These relationships are the exact opposite of what God intended. And to call the opposite of what God intended a marriage dishonors marriage and therefore dishonors God. Leviticus 18.22, Scripture says, Do not practice homosexuality. Have sex with, having sex with another man is with a woman. It is a detestable sin. Leviticus 20, 13, if a man practices homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman, both men have committed a detestable act. They must be put to death. They must both be put to death for they are guilty of a capital offense. Twice here in Leviticus, God makes it very clear that we should not have same-sex relationships. And on the second verse, Leviticus 20, 13, he adds a capital offense to it. As I was reading the scriptures today, I could hear somebody going, well, that's just the Old Testament and we don't follow the Old Testament anymore. And I begin to look in Leviticus 13, and I begin to notice, you start at verse 1, and I'm going to paraphrase, but the scriptures say, don't have sex with your mom, don't have sex with your dad, don't have sex with your brother, don't have sex with your cousin, don't have sex with your grandma, don't have sex with your neighbor's wife. And on and on and on, these instructions are there. And what I noticed was, nobody argues about that. But you get to verse 22, well, I don't know if that's what the Lord really meant. Really? Like, he, he meant... Here's the standard and follow the standard. The Apostle Paul, in Romans 1, 18 through 32, he writes and he tells us that a society that more and more rejects God will be more outspoken in making a case that unnatural things should not only be permitted, but also approved. Guess what type of society we live in today in 2021? We live in a society that has more and more rejected God. We live in a society that is more and more outspoken and making a case that unnatural things should not only be permitted, but also approved. We live in a society that says if you don't approve of same-sex relationships, you're being judgmental. Or are we just following what the author wrote? Now hear me for a second. Scripture clearly teaches us we should not approve of same-sex relationships, but we are to approve of those people. Okay? We don't disapprove people because they're doing something stupid. Wait, did you just call same-sex relationships stupid? 
Yeah, but I didn't mean to, but that's, yeah, pretty much. But here's the thing, watch. In the same way I think that's stupid, is for somebody to wrestle with alcoholism, that's stupid. Or I see people, we go out in public and I'm like, look at that idiot smoking. And like, you shouldn't call people idiot. And I'm like, but listen, with all the, all the education we have about the dangers of nicotine, why would anybody want to put something in their body like that? You know it's going to destroy your lungs. But we don't just shun those people. We welcome those people and we love people. And the point is simply this. To call same-sex relationships a marriage is to treat what is dishonorable to God as a marriage. And that's the exact opposite of honoring marriage. Now, God's judgment on same-sex relationships is not because he's some cosmic killjoy. His judgment is because these lifestyles are in direct rebellion to what he intended. Our opposition is not because of some homophobic fear. It's rather because of a settled conviction that the word of God is true and God knows better than anyone what is good for our society and for us. And God knows that a society that dishonors marriage is a society that's in decline and going to fall apart. Now I know this offends some people. And let me just remind you, um, being offended is a choice. And my prayer is that rather than being offended, you would say, Lord, open my heart and my ears to understand and hear the truth of your word. Lord, let the truth of your word be louder than the lies of the enemy. I want you to know, God loves you right where you are. God can and will save you from the sin in your life. He will turn your life around if you'll let him. And that's what's so amazing about his grace is he comes to us right where we are and he says, I love you. And I want to teach you to be the man and woman I've called you to be. So another way we dishonor marriage is through a term we call cohabitation. But what does that mean? It means living together and not being married. It means you're having sex with somebody who's not your lawful spouse. Now, have you noticed that we understand that for somebody who's married to have sex with somebody who's not their spouse, that's called adultery. And we're like, that's wrong. And yet we live in a society that says, well, if you're married to somebody and you're faith, if you're living with somebody and you're faithful, it's okay to have sex. That's called fornication. And both adultery and fornication dishonor marriage. And let me just go a little bit further and tell you that adultery is not just having sex with somebody who's not your spouse. Adultery starts in your heart. Jesus made this great statement in Matthew 5. He said, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, God ordained marriage as the only place for a sexual relationship. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, now regarding the questions you ask in your letter, yes, it's good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there's so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Here in Hebrews 13, the writer of Hebrews shows us the difference between what is honorable, marriage, and what is immoral, sex outside of marriage. Now, consider this regarding couples who live together. Marriage is an upfront commitment. If you're living together without being married, there's no upfront commitment. Remember Genesis 2.24? This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Remember what Jesus said. Haven't you read the scriptures? They record from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since there are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. With a couple living together, there's no upfront commitment. A man and a woman sharing their lives together as one flesh is honorable to God because it creates a foundation of trust in God and in that relationship. And there are people who will argue and they will say, well, a document or a ceremony doesn't define your commitment to someone. A piece of paper doesn't define my marriage. But doesn't it seem unrealistic to think you can be committed to somebody without a public profession of your relationship? I mean, which is more defining of a couple's commitment? 
Facebook official living together, or a wedding ceremony held in front of God, your family, and friends. And people say, well, I don't want a big wedding ceremony. You don't have to have a big wedding ceremony. I know of a couple, I know the man, I, I don't know his, his new wife, but um, it's a guy that I've known for years, and I saw on Facebook they were engaged, and I was down at the square a few weeks ago waiting for uh, Beth Marie's to open up. And so um, I was standing there just waiting, and they walked by, and I was like, hey, man, how you doing? Good to see you. And they said hi and went on. And I saw the other day they had this big, long post apologizing to everybody. They said, we know we have our big wedding scheduled in September or October, but we couldn't wait, so we went ahead and got married this weekend. And they're like, don't be offended. Why weren't you invited? You can come later. They said, we just got a justice of the peace and our parents, and we celebrated and made a commitment to each other. And I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Instead of dishonoring God, they went ahead and said, we're going to have a marriage ceremony, and we're going to make an upfront commitment, and we'll have a big celebration later. Marriage honors God. Uh, there's a there's a great book that I read um, called Messy Grace by Caleb Kaltenbach. And in this book, Caleb says, when people we love come to us and tell us about a part of their life that is out of line with Scripture, we have some choices. We can kick them out of our life. Don't do that. We can ignore it. Don't do that. We can change our beliefs so there's no tension between us. Don't do that. Or we can keep loving them and hold our beliefs firm. Do that. Listen, I feel like it's safe to say that everyone in this room today is closely connected to somebody who either is choosing a same-sex relationship or living together without being married. And if you're not really close, you're like one person removed from knowing somebody. Okay? But what in the world are we supposed to do? What do we do with people we know who live together? What do we do with people who we know who are in same-sex relationships? It's very, very simple. Write this down. You love them. You love them. You be friendly to them. You have them over for dinner. You go out to dinner with them. You go play miniature golf together, whatever you want to do together. And you pray for them. Now you don't pray, God, get them. God, convict them of their sin and show them that they're wrong. You pray, God, let the Holy Spirit soften their heart to hear you calling out to them that their lives can honor you. You encourage them. You try to be Jesus with skin on to them. You try to let your life be an example to them. You try to live in such a way that they see Jesus in you. And here's why we have to do that. God will convict them. God can change hearts. God can heal and restore. God does not need us to condemn or to judge. He needs us to represent him well. But, but I know the truth, and they need to know the truth. Okay, let me just like get up all in your... Cereal for a minute. I know you know the truth, but you have to remember Jesus is the truth. And in John 1 14, John wrote and said, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We're to be Jesus with skin on the people in our lives who are not following Scripture. We are to represent Jesus to them, the truth. We also have to have grace. So many people today want to be full of grace. I just want to be gracious to them. I'm just gracious. I'm just going to give them grace. I'm just going to give them grace. Grace without truth is acceptance of what's not right. Other people say, well, we're just going to tell them the truth. We're just going to throw a Bible at them and tell them, you're going to hell for the way you're living. All truth with no grace just causes you to beat people up. And you know what I've noticed? Beating people up with the truth doesn't bring anybody to Jesus. You know what else I noticed? Being full of gracious and just accepting everybody doesn't bring anybody to Jesus. You know what I noticed is that Jesus, full of grace and truth, was able to confront sinful people in a way that brought them to salvation. And so that's how we're to react around people who are doing things that dishonor God. We're to represent him with grace and truth. We're to love people the way God loves us. But that's the hard part sometimes because sometimes we are around people and we know that their lifestyle is dishonoring to God and we know that God's not pleased with their lifestyle, but God loves them. And there are times the Holy Spirit says, hey, I want you to speak truth into their life. And we're like, oh God, how do I do that? How do I speak truth without pushing them away? 
I don't know the answer to that other than to tell you this. You must rely on the Holy Spirit to give you the right words to say. You say, well, that really sounds really just really spiritual, Pastor. That's just so good. I'm glad you said that. Let me explain something to you today. And maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, before I came to the stage, my heart was pounding fast. Because I realize our subject today has the potential to make people mad. And the thought actually crossed my mind. This could be the last time I see some people in church. And as soon as I thought that, because I didn't have the guts to say it out loud, but I just did, the Holy Spirit reminded me. He said, don't worry, people left Jesus too. See, because in John chapter 6, I think it's verse about 66 which is kind of weird, right? 666, I don't know, just, just, sorry, that's just a different sermon, right? But Scripture says that Jesus taught, and, and they said, this teaching is hard. And Scripture says, John wrote that that day, many walked away from Jesus, and Jesus turned to his 12 disciples, and he says, you're going to leave too? And Peter was like, where are we going to go, Lord? Like, we've left everything to follow you. And so this morning, all of a sudden, I felt this release. You know what? I'm not trying to offend you. I love you. And I'm trying to teach you scripture with grace and truth. And I realize that people in our culture can't accept it, but it's okay. Um, God loves you. And if you're mad at me, God still loves you. And if I'm wrong, God still loves you, because I'm not. But if I am, he still loves me, and he'll show me. Let me go one more thing. Let me show you one more thing. We've talked about honoring marriage. We've talked about dishonoring marriage. Let me real quickly talk to you about this. Remain faithful. Hebrews 13, 4. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. The command to remain faithful declares a couple's responsibility to preserve intimacy in their relationship. For intimacy to stay strong between me and my wife, I can't just let her do all the work. I have to do the work too. For people who say, well, we just don't love each other anymore, it's not that you don't love each other, it's that you stopped developing intimacy. You stopped working for intimacy. Intimacy comes from the Latin word intimus, which means innermost. Intimacy is a close relationship between two people who both feel secure enough to share their innermost feelings. I have a friend who, who's now a pastor, but years ago he preached at a youth, youth rally. He was a youth pastor, and he talked about intimacy, and I've never forgotten his, his, his point. He said, intimacy means into me see. And so many people in their marriages, they're not being faithful in their marriage because they're not letting their partner, their spouse, see into them, see the real them. And guys, if I can just help you out, your wives know you better than you do. We're the ones that need to work on intimacy because they're pretty good at it. Intimacy in a relationship encourages emotional growth and spiritual maturity. But there's a danger in relationships. There's a danger that steals intimacy, and that's emotional adultery. Emotional adultery is creating intimacy with someone who is not your spouse. Emotional affairs begin like this. First of all, emotional affairs begin right here with somebody going, I would never have an affair in my, my wife. I would never have an affair in my husband. Never say never, because... For some reason, it's like the enemy is listening and he hears that word never. He goes, oh, well, let me just custom make something for you. Emotional affairs start like this. A simple conversation online. Yeah, that's dangerous. Oh, but my high school sweetheart found me on Facebook. Just lose them again because you lost them once, lose them again. And if I could just help you with this, the greatest thing you can do with online conversations is tell the person you're married to. I get friend requests. I hate, I hate it sometimes because I, people know me in town and I don't know them. And I have friend requests waiting for me to approve because I'm like, I don't know this person. And anytime it's a female, I'm like, hey, Jennifer, do we know this person? And she's like, nope. And I'm like, okay, decline. We don't know you. Why would I be like that? I want to make sure that my heart is pure. Another, another way that emotional affairs begin is a seemingly innocent friendship at work. No, you, ha you can't help the people you work with. You've got to be nice. You've got to know them. You've got to get along. But there's a word that people use that I, just, I despise. I hate it. I've heard people say, this is my work wife or this is my work husband. No, no, no. You're co-workers. There's no commitment. There's no relationship. Oh, but we spend eight to ten hours a day together. Yeah, you're co-workers who work together. 
You don't reveal your deepest, innermost secrets to your coworker. You save that for your spouse at home. And if you're doing that, you're in danger of emotional affairs. Perhaps, um, perhaps you just um, thought about how this person understands me more. If you're having thoughts about how this person understands me more than my spouse, you're in danger of an emotional affair. How do you recognize an emotional affair? Real quick, let me give you some signs. Don't answer these questions out loud, please. Don't tap anybody on the shoulder. Just listen. Do you share personal thoughts or stories with someone of the opposite sex? Do you feel greater emotional intimacy with that person over your spouse? Have you started comparing that person with your spouse and feeling your spouse doesn't add up? Do you longingly look forward to your next conversation with that person? Have you started changing your schedule to spend more time with this other person? Are you hiding conversations, times together with this person from your spouse? Are you spending significant amounts of time alone with this person? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you're having an emotional affair. and You're in danger of your relationship falling apart. So stop it. Just stop it. I had a friend years ago. Thankfully, by the grace of God, they're still married, but he had a coworker, and they were spending all kinds of time together, and they would leave work, and they would keep texting each other, my friend and this other, this other girl who wasn't his wife. And lo- before long, my friend's wife got mad at him. She was upset because he was always talking to this other girl. He would come home from work and have his phone out texting this other girl, and she was upset. And I'm like, well, yeah, because you spent all day with her, and now your wife wants your attention. And he just dug his heels in. That's nothing. That's no big deal. It was a big deal. It had the potential to destroy their marriage, but by the grace of God, it didn't because he opened his eyes and realized, oh man, this is so wrong. I've got to make things right with my wife. I want to close and read you this scripture. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. But you reply, no, that's not the road we want. Hebrews 13 clearly tells us how we are to honor marriage. It's the old godly way. And many today say, no, that's not the road we want. Refusal to walk in the path of the Lord is direct rebellion to the Lord. But why does marriage matter to God? Well, it's this radical in-your-face concept. You ready? Marriage is not about happiness. Marriage is about holiness. Marriage is about holiness not happiness. Marriage is a living illustration of the relationship God wants to have with us. Our society has made it about happiness. And isn't it interesting? The ultimate collapse of our society comes from the belief that we're entitled to be happy. And so we pursue happiness at all costs. Yet in the sacrament of marriage, the key to finding what we're seeking is being committed to that person. It's a holy moment. Marriage is a holy moment where we stand before our friends, our family, and God, and we take vows for a lifetime, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, and we invite God to be present with us in our deepest relationship. So when we hold marriage in high honor, we are living the way, we are living life the way God intended. When God authored marriage, he always intended marriage to be a living illustration of the intimacy he desires to have with us. Listen to me. The author wrote what he intended. He didn't misunderstand. He didn't change his mind. That would have been a good place for an amen. Let me say that again. The author wrote what he intended. He didn't misunderstand. He didn't change his mind. To change the defini- definition of marriage brings dishonor to that, to, to that which God created as a thing of beauty. And my friend sent me this um, quote this week from somebody I'm not real familiar with, but I'm going to steal that quote and I kind of reworded it a little bit. So many today have this idea they can live how they want and they'll be okay in the end because God is a God of love. Some even go so far to say, God is a God of love, I'm going to be okay even if I'm wrong. That's not how it works. Jesus clearly said in Matthew 7, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 14, 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. You can live how you want, but know this, at the end of your life, 
When you breathe your last breath here in this body and you step into eternity, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to stand before the living God and you're going to give an account of your life. You can't explain away, why didn't you follow my laws? Why didn't you follow my word? Well, God, because society changed the definition and I liked it. I thought it was good. Well, God, I knew you were a God of love and even if I'm wrong, you'd still love me. You wouldn't punish me. That's not how it works. We all will give an account of our personal lives to God. He is the author of marriage. We should honor what he wrote. Let's pray today. God, I thank you today. Thank you for your amazing love and your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, thank you for surrounding us with the presence of God and leading us today and speaking to hearts today. And I pray that the message shared today, the word shared, is exactly what you wanted to be shared and it touches hearts in exactly the way you want it to touch hearts. And Father, I pray over those who are here today, there are men, there are women, there are students, that perhaps during our time together, the Holy Spirit has, has begun to knock at the door of their heart and he's convicting them of some things in their life that are contrary to your word. Give them the boldness and the courage to just to respond to the convicting tug of the Holy Spirit and help them to realize that you love them and you are convicting them because you want them to see the truth of your word. You want the truth of your word to be louder than the lies of the enemy and you want them to repent and be the man or woman of God you've called them to be. Father, I pray over those who are here today because I know there are some as well that this morning as we've talked about different ways to dishonor marriage, they realize that there are people in their life that are doing just that and they need, they need help to represent Jesus to the people in their life who live a way that dishonors you. Holy Spirit, would you empower your sons and daughters today to interact with those who are living dishonoring lives, to interact with them in the same way Jesus would with grace and truth. Maybe there are some that they realize the Holy Spirit showing them, you know, you've been trying to interact with grace and truth, but you've been a little heavy on truth and not so much grace, or vice versa, heavy on grace and not so much truth. Holy Spirit, anoint sons and daughters to let them see the balance. Just like Jesus had, he was full of grace and full of truth. And we can only operate, we can only speak full of grace and full of truth by being connected to Jesus. So help us to represent Jesus well in our lives today. Bless each one today in Jesus' name. Just for a moment, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's looking around. So I want to ask you these two quick questions. And I'm going to pray a blessing over you and we're going to be done today. But I wonder if you're here today and you say, Pastor, today. And remember, friends, nobody's looking around. It's between you and Jesus. Say, Pastor, today, the Holy Spirit's convicted me during our time and I need to allow him to lead me in experiencing the grace of God in my life today. There's something in my, in my heart the Holy Spirit's convicting me and I just need to be obedient and surrender to him. If that's you, slip up your hand. I'm gonna pray for you this morning. And my second question is this. Are you here today? And you need the Lord to help you represent Jesus to some people in your life who live in a way that dishonors God. Today, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to interact with them like Jesus would, full of grace and truth. If that's you, slip up your hand. I wanna pray for you today. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you. Father, I thank you today. Thank you for this honor we've had to come and to worship you through your word and worship in your presence and be with our family today. And Lord, I thank you for the hands that were raised responding to the message today. You saw the hands, you know the hearts of your sons and daughters. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are a convicting agent. You work in ways we never understand. But this morning, as you've convicted hearts, you've stirred hearts, you've shown some individuals that there are things in their life that bring dishonor to God. Now give them the courage to let go of those things and to change, to submit. To remember that Jesus said that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So bring freedom today to your sons and daughters. Father, you saw the hands that were raised. There were several that said, I need the Lord to help me represent Jesus to some people in my life. There are some individuals in my life some people that I know, that I know their lifestyle doesn't honor God. It actually dishonors God. And I need the Holy Spirit to equip me, to strengthen me, to speak into their life with grace and truth. Holy Spirit, do just that. Help them to know when to speak and to know when to remain silent. Holy Spirit, give them wisdom and discernment to speak with boldness as you lead. Give them the courage 
So just silently pray and say, Lord, help them to see the truth. Help them to see Jesus in me. God, forgive us for the times we've addressed people with good intentions, trying to help them see the error of their ways, but we've not done it with grace and truth. And Holy Spirit, help us all to be men and women who are led by this Spirit, full of this Spirit, to be just like Jesus to the people in our lives that we can operate with grace and with truth. The fathers, we go our separate ways and we go throughout this week. I pray over your sons and daughters. Would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you show your kindness and have mercy on them? Watch over them and give them your peace today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church, and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.